Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 5 of Aero 3261. Today we're going to be looking at the stresses that we get when we have elements that are fastened together. We call these structural joints. A lot of, we're going to see that there's a shear is a big piece of that and we're going to look further into the bearing stresses and some other specialized stresses. Here are some examples of some structural joints like a lap joint where we have two sheets that are tied together with a row of fasteners, maybe one or more fasteners. If these two sheets develop tension stresses, you're going to get uh, shear stresses on the fastener as they those uh, two sheets try to move apart and the fastener holds them together. Also, we're going to see that it causes a bearing stress under that. So if we look at a lap joint like this one, actually uh, this is couple pictures of lap joint. This is a side view. This is kind of a three-dimensional view. And if we look at that, as we pull these two, say that's a fastener, and if these two parts are trying to slip apart, you'll notice, first of all, you're going to get a net tension at the fastener. We're going to look at that in a minute. We're going to see that if you actually slip your hacksaw between the two sheets and cut off the fastener, when you take it apart, it's going to look, have a cross-sectional area like this. That's the only part holding it together, that fastener and the other fasteners. So just that force, which is parallel to the area, is now a shear, going to cause a shear stress, and the magnitude is going to be P over A. Since the fastener is generally round, this is the equation for that. Now, while the stress is probably not uniform, it comes close to being uniform, and we're going to pretend it's uniform. So we're just going to use that P over A average stress as the stress on the fasteners. That's one of the primary checks we'll see anytime we have fasteners at structural joints. So what is the shear force in the fastener? So our first idea is going to be finding out how much force per fastener. The second one is going to be looking at that shear force in the fastener and shear stress. And we're going to look at a number of other things that occur when we have a structural joint. So just to prepare for moving forward, take a look here. We can see in this first figure, we've got two plates fastened with this fastener. And therefore, since there's only one fastener, there's only one shear plane, all the force is carried by that area P over A. In this lower joint, we can see the same thing, only one fastener carrying all that load. If we'd had a row of, say, three fasteners, then it would be that force over three on each area of the fasteners. Now, while we can actually add all the areas of all the fasteners together, as we will do later for more complicated analysis in arrow 3271, usually what we will do is calculate the force per fastener and then just divide that and look at the stress in a single fastener. Does that make sense? So if we have a, let's imagine that this plate here is attached to another one. We have a force pulling it like this. And if there's a fastener, you can see that that's resisted. If we're pulling the plate upward, then actually the thing that keeps the plate from moving upward is this fastener bearing against this area here. You see that? Before it goes into bearing, we're going to see that actually that force in the fastener, if you take a look closely at this part, you see first, now we know we're going to actually fan this load out, probably at something like 45 degrees, but usually what we'll do is say, okay, we're far enough apart. If we take a cross section here, our part is going to look something like this, our area, it's just P over A. If we take a cross section here, once again, our area looks something like this, P over A, same stress, same stress here. Now, time we get down here, we see we have this hole. So actually what we have is this area here. Now, if we draw, let's just take a section cut like this. So that means we grab that with our hand and rotate that out. That means the plate looks like this, but it has a fastener like this. That means this is the area here. If this is the width of the part B, and this is the diameter of the hole D, then while this these stresses up here are P over A, which is P over D T, the stress right here through this section is going to be P over B minus D T. That's the net stress. It's the net average stress, right? This the net stress up here is just this. Excuse me, did I say P over DT? Up here, this is P over BT, right? 
over BT, right? Width, we look at the cross section, the width times the thickness. Okay, so P over BT is our net stress up here, but the net stress through the hole is now P over B minus DT. So we're going to learn, uh, we already saw in the last lecture about stress concentrations, we know we're going to need this net stress, and then we multiply by the theoretical stress concentration factor in order to get the max stress, right? But right now we're just talking about what this net stress is. A lot of times we're going to not use the stress concentration factor if we're looking at stresses up near ultimate, and we'll just do this net stress. So if I ask you to look for what's the max stress, then you're going to want to calculate that. But a lot of times for fasteners, and there's some other reasons we'll talk about later, we'll just calculate the net stress, okay? So when we have this force, the first check we're going to make is we're imagining this force working through the member, and before it can load up the fastener, we have to make sure it's good in the member for tension. It's tension up here, tension, tension, tension. And the critical section is right here. We have the net stress P over B minus D T. That is our net stress, net tensile stress. It's a normal stress. If the structure does not, cannot withstand this, and we can check that against F to you, right? If it can't withstand this, then it's not going to withstand anything else. If it's successful for this, we can go on to the next structural test, which we'll look at next. This is how it reacts here, that force. Half of it goes to each of these, and we can just write it this way. Make sense? Okay, the next idea. Now that we have this load in the member, we can see that that member, actually this Remember, this is doing this. See this fastener? See how it's pressing into the joint? We're actually getting contact along here. So P over the area of contact is another stress occurring. Now, since it's pressing against it, we call that a bearing stress. Yes, it is compression. Usually we use compression if it's a loading like this. The word bearing has the idea that there's a lot more material back here beyond the area we're calculating. We call that a bearing stress. So the way we're going to do this, you'll notice if we look at this, it's a rather complicated distribution because if we look at our part, let's just draw our part here. And if we have a fastener in here, we see that the force that this fastener causes is on this area and it's a rather complex stress distribution. We're going to use a simplification. Instead of using this area, because that area has peaking, we're going to just take this area here, this distance, and the thickness. It's like projecting an area here. So actually, we're just going to pretend that it's pressing on this little square angle here, area here, where this is the fastener diameter, and this is the thickness. Once again, this is the thickness, and this is the diameter. So our bearing stress. Now, it's true that bearing is a compression, but compression is something we usually use if we have like a rod. Notice that the area in the vicinity is the same and there's not a lot of extra area, but if we push on something locally and let's say like let's say the bed, your mother's bed, you're standing on your mother's bed and you're pushing on it, you'll notice this thing can't really buckle out of the way. There's a lot more area available. The load fans out and we can just look at the bearing stress. Like if we looked at the little area under your little feet, right, the area of your foot acting P over the area of your foot, that would be the, the bearing stress acting on it. It is a compressive stress. We're going to call it a bearing stress in the same way for fasteners, that bearing stress. Now we're going to compare the bearing stress to a new allowable, which we're going to call BRU, FBRU. You're going to notice in your handbook, you get values of FBRU for E over D ratios of 2.0 and E over D ratios of 1.5. Now for our class, we're just going to use 2.0. What that means is if we look at what's the distance of the center of the fastener to the edge of the plate, that's called the edge distance. And if we divide that by the diameter of the fastener, that gives us a ratio. 
Structural design is usually done for an E over D ratio of about 2.0, okay? And a good design will have that. Repairs sometimes have less, and that's why Mill Handbook in our appendix apply it gives us values for 1.5. Like, let's say you have to drill out a fastener and go into the next size up fastener. They put a larger fastener, or maybe they drill it just off center so you violate that 2.0 edge distance, E over D ratio. That's why we have these other values. We're actually not going to use these in these, this class. I decided to put them in your handbook because if you're doing projects or something, you may want to use them, and you should be aware of how those are used. Okay? So that's our bearing stress. So the first thing we're going to check at is our net stress. Then we're going to check our bearing stress. And that's what we said. Okay. The next idea is our tear-out stress. Going back to our original thing, remember we had this free body diagram. If we pull in tension, we have it reacted here, and we already saw how we have our two net tension stresses there. But we also, if we just imagine this thing ripping through, imagine this force, draw a little free body diagram with this cut. Imagine, actually, this force here is trying to push this part of the plate down through the plate, and that's causing shear on these two planes. So if that's true, then we see, and, and once again, we're using this little, this is our edge distance, right? E from the center of the fastener to the edge of the plate. So if we see that, we've got these two little areas. If I draw this in 3D, this thing looks like this, where this, this is E, and this is T. So P over 2 is the force on each of those two areas, and ET is the area of each of those areas, so our shear stress is this. Now, we're normally not going to check shear stresses. Now, it looks like it's P over 2 ET, but remember, it's P over 2 over ET. That's, that's the formula, okay? You'll no, we're noted, normally not going to check this unless I tell you to, te to check tear out, and the reason is if structural design is developed so that we follow a good edge distance over D ratio of 2.0 or greater, then you shouldn't have a problem with shear tear out. But if somebody violates that and puts a fastener really close to the edge, then we need to check shear tear out to make sure that our part is good. Once you calculate the shear stress from shear tear out, you're then going to compare that to FSU. So it would be FSU over FS minus 1. That's your margin of safety. That's how we check shear tear out. And once again, we're only going to check that when we need to. Okay. In this little picture down here, you see we've got the same thing. But this time, that force is divided. We've got two fasteners. A force comes through this. It goes to these two fasteners. So actually, we have half the force on each of these. And half of that half is on each of these little areas. So it's P over 2 over 2 over ET. This is what that movie was all about, ET Phone Home? Yeah, that's what it was about. Okay, we said all this. Got that? All right. Now, the next idea is, uh, now we saw before we had a plate loaded in single shear. And that means when we pulled on this, if we only had a single fastener, all of that shear went through that. But let's say we have a, a two plates. Imagine this is a plate, and this is a plate, and this is a plate, and they're fastened together with a fastener through here. You'll notice when you do that, you now have this fastener going through, and you have two shear planes, right? See that? You've got two shear planes. You've got whatever force in this fastener is, half of that comes up and half of this comes down. So the shear force, the shear stress in the fastener is now P over 2, right? P over 2 divided by the area of the fastener. That's the, it's called double shear because we have two shear planes. A free body diagram here kind of shows this where the first plate is being pulled with this force F and it's being reacted by the upper and lower plate, FC and FD. FC and FD each are obviously half of F. Therefore, the shear force in this little free body diagram of the fastener, that force P is just F over 2. So F over 2 over the area of the fastener, which is pi D over 2 squared, is how we do that. 
Okay. One other idea is the idea of bearing columns. Now remember a lot of times when we talk about bearing in structural joints, we're really talking about that bearing that occurs on a fastener P over DT. But remember I said, so if we have, imagine this column, this wooden column, and it's loaded with a force 40 kilonewtons. Well, the stress that we worry about in the column is a compressive stress, P over A, where the area is just this 0.1 meter times 0.12 meter, right? However, and that's just compared, that's a compressive stress, so we compare that to F sub C. So actually, if we turn on our little pen, we see that first we're going to have this force acting on this area. So our, air, our, for, our stress is just going to be P over... Uh, 0.12 times 0.1, right? That's our compressive stress. We would get our FCU divided by our F sub C minus 1 is our margin of safety. Actually, we also want to check stability once we learn how to do that. Now, when we get down here to the bottom, we have the same area. We actually have the same stress, but now it's acting on this plate. And if we look at that plate, we see that the area that the force is applied to is right here, right? But actually, there's a lot more area available. So instead of using the compressive allowable, we can actually call that a bearing stress. It actually has the same magnitude as this, but we can compare this against the bearing allowable of the part. Right? So that divided by a bearing stress is minus 1 is our margin of safety. That's because we're actually bearing on something that has a much larger area. Now, if that's good, that's using the bearing allowable of this concrete. Then we get to the soil, and we see that under the soil, there's even more area below that. So once again, we're going to use that same bearing stress. Uh, we're going to get the bearing allowable of the soil this time, divided by the bearing stress we calculated. And this time now, because we're down here, we have a much larger area. Now, our bearing stress on the soil is just going to be P over this BB, right? This huge area, minus one, that's our margin of safety for that. That's how you do that. That's bearing stresses. Bearing of like the idea of pushing against something. If it's a long slender member, we'll, remember, we'll call it compression and check it against the compress on, compression allowable. If it's pressing into a continuous thing, like pressing into my body or into the floor, since there's a lot more area as you move away from where the force is applied, we can just call that bearing stressing compared to our bearing allowable. Got it? Blah, 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 blah. That's what this says. Okay. Practice ideas. Here we go. What checks do we have to make here? So first we're going to check net tension. We've got 10 kips in the leftmost plate. We can take the width of that plate minus the holes. There are two holes, so 2 times the diameter. So width minus 2 times the diameter times T is the total area. P over that net area gives us our net stress check in against FTU. Then we can check and say, well, if our edge distance is sufficient, we're not going to need to check shear tear out. Otherwise, we would check shear tear out in this lower plate, P over 2ET of that, where T is the thinner plate. If we have an edge distance of more than two, or if that shear tear out check looks good, now we have bearing and we check bearing. We have the full force on these, but actually you'll notice there are two fasteners, so actually five kips per fastener. So five kips in the first fastener divided by the bearing area DT. Check that against FBRU using the e edge distance E over D ratio of 2.0. Make sure that's good. If that's good, we now have the load in the fastener. And we see if you look at that fastener, it's held by the one plate, but there's plates above and below, which means we now have two shear areas. So this is in double shear. So we have, remember, we only have half of that 10 kips. We only got five kips in that fastener. And now that five kips is divided by two shear planes. So five over two is the force divided by the cross-sectional area of the bolt. That's our shear check. We check that against FSU of the bolt. Or often with bolts, we'll get the allowable as a, instead of a stress, we'll often get as a force value. So if we have a force allowable for the bolt, we just compare it to the applied load, uh, two and a half kips. If we have a stress allowable, we calculate the P over A for that two and a half kips. 
and then check it against that stress. Now that we have the force transferring through each of those into the upper and lower plate, we then can check the upper plate for bearing, P over DT. Now what we have is that 2.5 kips in each of these for that bearing check, where the thickness now is the upper and lower plate thickness. Acting separately, we'll check P over DT of the upper plate, and separately P over DT of the lower plate. If they're the same thickness, you only need to check one, okay? Then we can check our shear tear out if needed, and then we can check our shear in the fat. Uh, we already checked our shear in the fastener, so now we can do a net tension check in that plate. Now, if all these plates have the exact same thickness, obviously the thinner plate is the critical plate, and we just need to make those checks. If these upper and lower plates are thinner, we might need to check those as well. This is another one. Once again, we have double shear, same story. This is a little example from. Beer and Johnson. It's got a lot going on. The first step to solving this would be to take this 30 kilonewton force, sum our moments about point A, and then sum our vertical forces, and calculate our reactions. Then we would use the methods of statics to calculate the forces in each of these members using the method of pins or joints, uh, of joints or uh, sections. Then, the, now that we have that, we would then check the stresses in those, any shear stresses against FSU, any tension stress against FTU. We could then look at these fasteners. We see this upper, upper joint at point C is a single shear fastener, so we can check our bearing and our shear for that fastener. This one at point B is in double shear, so we can check our bearing and shear in those fasteners. And then at A, once again, we're in double shear, we could check that for that loading. Make sense? And this is shown here, blah, blah, blah. If you have a copy of Beer and Johnson, you can read through that example in more detail and see how that is solved. This will help drive home some of these principles. Also, there are some examples in E.F. Brune's book. That's what we have. These fastener checks that I introduced are something that if you go into aircraft, airspace structures, you're going to calculate, you're going to use these equations a lot, a lot. Everybody knows how to check shear and fasteners. Most people get that mostly right. They all know how to check bearing, and they usually get that close to right or right. Shear tear out is checked a lot less frequently because with good structural design, that won't be an issue. But you should know how to calculate that for whenever you have a short edge distance. And what else? Net tension. That's something that sometimes is neglected in industry, but you're going to need to check that too. A comprehensive analysis will do that. Make sure you study these, do the homework, uh, call in on any Zoom session. So if you have any questions, enjoy.